Hello, hello, hello. Welcome to The Real Thing. I am your host, Joe Lawrence. Welcome. Hello. Uh, the Real Thing is an extension of Bergen Film Club, Bergen Film Society, which is a film society, independent cinema in Bergen, Norway. This podcast talks about the films included in the film club's program. And I talk about why they're cool, why we chose them, why you should watch them, and just why they're great films in general. Today is the first time I'm releasing an episode on a Thursday. And it's different. The weekend is uh, is just around the corner, and I'm excited. The reason that we're doing some different uh, scheduling, so the normal episodes will still be out on Monday, but for the month of November, or at least the last half of the month of November, because I didn't uh, upload previously, uh, we're going to be talking all about the upcoming Trash Film Festival, which will be happening the 24th to the 26th of November, so next week from this episode. Um, and basically, I'm just going to be talking about what is trash, why is it exciting, why should you go see it, uh, why you should come to the festival. It's going to be a great load of fun. Uh, I've linked to the the festival's website in the show notes. And last week we talked about what is trash and kind of the history of exploitation film and power cinema. And it was very, very interesting. I didn't know it was sort of like a, it was punk rock before punk rock existed, which I think is really, really cool. Uh, and like the legacy of it, I think... Maybe nowadays it's kind of more of like a culty joke. But back, you know, in the 1920s and 30s, it was a real way of like sticking it to the man. And I I like that because Hollywood is trash and it's literally trash. As in trash negative. But trash positive was a way of subverting norms and just being really fucking cool. In the last... uh, 20 years or so, maybe 20, 30 years. Trash has changed. Maybe even more than maybe the past 50 years. It's changed. Uh, as the kind of the advent of like, anyone can make a film now and uh, anyone can put out any, anything out. It's sort of, I think it's changed what we can label trash. Just to being genuinely bad movies that are sort of so bad, it's like bafflingly good this is The Room by Tommy Wiseau. It is John Waters' films. Uh, although I think that he is extremely visionary and amazing. So I don't know that I would lump him with trash, but he is kind of like the, the king of filth, so I guess he's not too far away. But today we're talking about someone of a myth in my life. Uh, a man who is so interesting and kind of inspiring to me. That I feel like we had to do an entire episode about who he is and his movies. And that is Neil Breen. I didn't know anything about Neil Breen. I have to say before I attended last year's Trash Film Festival where we watched Double Down. Which is probably one of the more strange film experiences that I've ever had. It's very bad. It's terribly acted. The writing, however... It's like, it's kind of blind and the perspective, I think, is kind of commentary is a bit warped on like society, but he he's not not making good points. Double Down was kind of, Neil Breen is playing this because of course he stars in his own films. He writes the movies, he edits them, he directs them, he produces them, he funds it. He does the catering, he does the hair and makeup, he does everything. This is truly a one-man show with the occasional other person in it which may also just be him twice but double down was sort of like him playing this because obviously if you are kind of at the helm of your own existence in a movie he makes himself this the most attractive sought after intelligent smart man ever and he plays like a, a hacker i guess taking down the government or something i have no idea it was kind of hard to keep track of but His, like, extremely long monologues, which are done kind of, like, by dubbing a scene. It's very curious. And he has a lot to say. And I think that his mind and his conviction to being a filmmaker is just... It is something that I find quite admirable. So I'm going to just dive into who he is for a bit. So, 
I took a lot of information from an interview that he did with Influx magazine in, I think, 2016 or around then. And also from Film Obsessive, an article written by Nick Luciano, which was written three years ago. And I also spent a lot of time on the Neil Breen Reddit. Because the first thing that I just had to get out of the way is it's my biggest question as I've kind of delved into, because he's made a good number of films by now since 2011 or 2013, and I'm so curious how he makes his movies, like, funds them. He is over 60. He, uh, I like, what has he been doing for the rest of his life? But I recently found out that he was an architect for the majority of his life. He went to school to be an architect, and since then he just spent... The majority of his life until he seemingly lost his architect license uh, from the state of Nevada in 2011 and then he went to make movies. So let's begin with how did he become the cult icon that we know him today. Sometime in late 2015 the films of Neil Breen came into the world. Like many Breen fans, it was discovered, the former Architects films, through an episode of Red Letter Media's YouTube show, Best of the Worst, in which host Rich Evans stumbles his way through describing the incomprehensible plot to Breen's first feature, Double Down. While he had already begun to develop a cult following, the Red Letter Media review helped Breen's films reach a broader audience, and Breen's features have become staples on the So Bad That They're Good YouTube channels and podcasts. Hey, podcasts. Breen is the director of five fiction feature films to date, uh, which is now six, I believe. He has a new one that just came out in 2023. So it's Double Down in 2005, I Am Here, dot, 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 now, 2009, Fateful Findings, 2013, Pass Through, 2016, Twisted Pair, 2018, and his new film, which came out this year, 2023, Cade, The Tortured Crossing, in which I believe he plays twins. And then a not a documentary, Neil Breen Five Film Retrospective, released in 2022. So this article that I'm taking all of this information from examines some of the recurring themes in Breen's movies and provide a brief synopsis of all the films. It also grouped together uh, Breen's films into somewhat arbitrary errors on themes and production aspects. This categorization may be easily changed as Breen continues to produce films. Should be aware that he's a uh, grading on a heavy curve whenever talking about the elements of Breen's films, faces like satisfying ending and coherent plot should be viewed in comparison to his other films. Additionally, none of the plot descriptions can ever begin to actually describe what happens in the film, which in in every case is too convoluted to capture a mere summary, because a lot happens in these films, and it's a lot to cover. The biggest criticism of auteur theory is that film is too collaborative to be ascribed to a single artist. But Breen presents a truly unique conception of an auteur that almost literally does everything from directing to craft services. There's even a recurring joke in the credits of his films where every company that has an N or a B in it was personally done by Neil Breen. And trust, N's and B's are abound in the credits. Breen's films fail at pretty much every level. The acting, with Breen exclusively serving as the lead actor, plots, directing, dialogue, editing, prop sets, special effects, and cinematography are all bafflingly dreadful, and he's often the only person handling these aspects. However, despite, or maybe because of, these low production value, the films are rarely ever boring, and the omnipresence of Breen's bizarre sensibility is perhaps the single biggest factor that makes his films watchable. At the heart of all of Breen's films is a deep distrust in government, corporations, the media, and other establishment uh, institutions. Breen views these as groups of hypocrites, liars, and cheaters who destroy the environment, start wars for profit, and manipulate these institutions to remain in power. While these views are essentially correct, Breen's simplistic understanding and on-the-nose proselytizing about them even comes across more as amusing rants than a serious doctrine. Breen's environmental tendencies are most clearly illustrated in I Am Here, Now, which has former environmental activists as protagonists and politicians openly bragging about the bribes they accepted to vote against renewable energy. All of Breen's films manifest his apparent messiah complex. It's been long joked that Breen only ever plays two characters, Super Spy Hacker and Space Jesus. 
Breen employs one of two archetypes for the character that he plays in every one of his movies. Super spy hacker in Double Down, Fateful Findings, and Twisted Pair, Space Jesus in I Am Here Now, and Pass Through. Although these two archetypes are different on the surface, Breen uses them identically. They have some skill or knowledge that they must use to rid the world of an evil corporation. Breen seems to focus on corruption instead of evil. Breen's villains are treated like parasites driven by greed whose eradication will actively make the world a better place rather than being driven by an unknowable force. The similarities between the two archetypes are on full display in Breen's third and fourth films, Fatal Findings and Pass Through. Fatal Findings ends with Breen's super spy hacker holding a press conference to reveal the most secret government and corporate secrets, leading to mass suicides among politicians and CEOs. Whereas Pass Through, Breen's space Jesus, takes over a television station to inform the world that he has eliminated 300 million people he viewed as corrupt. You could even view Neil Breen Five film retrospective as a manifestation of his messiah complex. He is attempting to impart the wisdom that will save aspiring independent filmmakers from having to go to film school. The only film where there is some doubt of the sincerity of Breen's uh, messianic characters is Double Down. In the film, there is a brief scene where Breen's character, Aaron Brand, is told that Megan, the girl whose brain cancer he thought he cured with a magic rock, didn't get better. Brand is momentarily confused before immediately brushing the revelation aside to continue his super spy work. Whether intentional or not, leaning towards not, Brand's failure casts doubt on the image that has been presented to us. Could everything that he's doing simply be a delusion that isn't based on reality? Given the ego trip that is the rest of the movie, it is thought that this interpretation is unlikely, but some think that there are other moments, exclusively eating tuna fish and saving the cans in his trunk, almost crashing his car because he's eating tuna out of a can while driving, living in his car in the desert, that could point to everything happening in his head. So now we're going to look at some of his early films. It's Double Down, 2005, and I Am Here Now, 2009. Breen has admitted that these films are lower quality than his subsequent ones, they're also hardest to find because Breen removed them from circulation, but they are still worth seeking out. The best description that can be offered for Double Down is Jodorowsky's El Topo, if it didn't understand anything of its own mysticism or symbolism. Breen plays a super hacker and former intelligence agent Aaron Brand, whose fiancé is murdered by a sniper. Brand decides to live in his car in the desert that is protected by an invisible force field that kills anyone who tries to sneak up on him. He is constantly haunted by visions of his ex-wife and parents. Bran works as an assassin and mercenary, planning and committing acts of biological terrorism before fighting against the other terrorists. Unfortunately, it's been found that Double Down is a little slow at times, with the pace being hindered by surreal elements, repetitive music and repeating scenes, and monotone voiceover. Which I have decided that I actually quite enjoyed because I was so interested by what he was saying that I wanted to listen. But regardless, it is a must-watch for Breen and cult cinema fans. I Am Here Now represents Breen's first use of Space Jesus archetype, and wow is it unsubtle. Breen's character, credited as The Being, apparently created Earth, and is upset that humans are failing. He decides to help three people, two of which have lost their jobs as environmental activists and have turned to sex work, and a man who was dying of cancer but wanted to see the Welcome to Las Vegas sign before he died. I Am Here Now is probably most famous having four ellipses in its title and the weird Halloween mask we Breen wears at points of to portray the being. While it is entertaining, I don't know how many people would list it as their favourite Breen film. So this takes us to Fateful Findings from 2013. It's probably his most popular film. It marks a departure from the desert settings and heavy faux mysticism of the first two films, instead taking place in the suburbs with only touches of faux mysticism. The quality of the plot also takes a major step forward from the previous two films. The film tells the story of a man named Dylan who reconnects with his childhood sweetheart Leah, played by Jennifer Autry, after not seeing her for several decades. Dylan has become a novelist, uh, but he hates writing books and is secretly hacking the computer systems of the government and major corporations. Along the way, there is a room that is supposed to be a black void, but it's actually just covered in a trash bag. The worst murder cover-up in film history that still somehow works, unexplained teleportation, a mushroom that turns into another magic rock, and a near-infinite uh, infinite amount of additional zaniness. 
While it isn't a prototypical Breen film, Fateful Finding is probably the most accessible of his films and is a great place to start of his work. From Pass Through in 2016 and Twisted Pair in 2018, these are often grouped together for a few reasons. Firstly, these films were produced after the Red Letter Media Review, which exploded Breen's popularity to the point where Breen was able to raise additional funds for Pass Through via a crowdfunding site. There is also much heavier reliance on special effects, including the introduction of drone shots and extensive use of green screen. It's said that Pass Through is Breen's magnum opus. The film starts out telling the story of a godlike being named Teal, spelt T H G I L which he chooses for himself when he saw an empty cup of light yogurt. Who inhabits the body of a man that recently overdosed on heroin while living in a disgusting trailer in the middle of the desert and befriends two undocumented immigrants who escape from being trafficked across the border? That's the normal part. The film escalates to Teal blowing up a cartoonish green, uh, green screen mansion after yelling at a businessman and politicians for being immoral and corrupt and then murdering 300 million people with his mind, and then ranting to the world while on television. It's crazy. Every performance is cranked up to 11, the plot is non-stop absurdity, and the incredible ending run is the purest expression of Breen's ungraspable political ethos. This last point may seem minor, but it's also said to appreciate that it's not only recalls, but ties pass through to Double Down and I Am Here Now, which also features the desert prominently. The desert outside Las Vegas serves as an element that unifies Pass Through with previous films, making it feel like a culmination of themes of this movie. Breen's endgame, if you will. While still entertaining a f- uh, and a film that would be recommended, it's said that Twisted Pair represents a step backward from the peak of Fateful Findings of Pass Through. The main problem is that not actually that much happens. The plot of Twisted Pair is a lot thinner than the previous two movies, and Breen wanted to set up a sequel. The ending is less satisfying and more incomplete than any of Breen's previous films. Breen also reuses a lot of footage throughout the movie, which he does a lot, which feels like filler and contributes to a feeling that there simply wasn't a lot of substance. The film revolves around twin brothers Cade and Kale, both played by Breen, with the help of the world's second worst fake moustache and beard. The brothers are given cybernetic enhancements, presumably by an alien, which also turns Kale evil. Cade is trying to stop a terrorist named Kuzks, who has a biological mutant warfare plans, as you can see in the glorious four-minute trailer, which is roughly 4.5% of the film's runtime, and includes the final shot of the film. The majority of the film's dialogue is comprised to similar Mad Lib-esque techno bubble. Which, uh, techno bubble? That's perfect. That's basically all of his films. Twisted Pair also has the most distressing scene in any Breen film, where Cade, who is supposed to be the good twin, appears to stalk, break into the house of, and attempt to assault a woman that turns out to be his girlfriend role-playing with him. The author of this article said that he saw Twisted Pair in theatres, and the entire audience was confused and deeply uncomfortable during this scene. Luckily, the sequence is short, and the film quickly moved on with more zaniness, but the scene felt incredibly out of place and very unnecessary. Now, I've been very excited to talk about this. A documentary, non-documentary, Neil Breen 5 film, Retrospective from 2020. So Retrospective is a five and a half hour runtime film that costs uh, about 160 US dollars to watch. It is essentially a Neil Breen masterclass course. Breen discusses his filmmaking process ostensibly to help other independent filmmakers learn how to make and market films. What's been seen so far of Retrospective feels more like a cynical cash grab than his fiction films, especially when you consider the unseemly price he's charging for it when he looks like he didn't spend a cent to produce it, since the documentary mainly consists of him sitting on his couch in his studio speaking directly into a camera with lengthy sequences of clips of his movies interspersed. It's been concerned that Retrospective might be the point where Breen officially jumped the shark, but I don't know for sure until the presumptive Twisted Pair sequel comes out. I think that he might have begun to buy his own hype in recent years, uh, denying that they are midnight movies in direct contradiction with an interview five years before when he said that he embraced his cult following and cracking down on YouTube channels and merchandise he felt infringes on his copyright. He obviously is allowed to enforce copyright uh, issues, but authorised depictions and events are part of what connects cult phenomena with an audience. Retrospective is the most glaring example of this shift. The role recently he's begin he's kind of began to take himself very seriously as a as a director. 
and a filmmaker whereas i think he was quite open to the idea of it but then since i don't know if he's gone at any success like in the in the most rudimentary sense of the word but i think he is starting to get a bit of an inflated ego and kind of doesn't want to be associated with his sort of like trashy beginnings and definitely is wanting to distance himself from the red letter media stuff it's obviously very easy to make fun of Breen's films, but there's also a level of respect for him, which is shared by many of his fans. No matter what, Breen is someone that has self-funded five feature films and almost certainly turned a profit while uncompromisingly following his unique vision for his films. It may seem like a ridiculous statement, and I don't know if I would be writing about this, he says. Breen's films helped introduce several film YouTube channels and podcasts focused on cult and mainstream cinema, which further taught about what to look for in a well-made movie. I have to say that I do find auteurs like Neil Breen to be quite inspirational in a way, because at the end of the day, I remember when I watched The Room and Double Down, I just thought to myself, have I ever made a movie? Have I screened it across the world? And no, and these people have. They had a vision and they made a movie and they sat down and they wrote and prepared and they made a feature film. And Neil Breen's kind of like unflinching unwillingness to compromise on any of his ideas is pretty respectable, but then I also guess he doesn't have to compromise anything if he is the only one in creative control of everything. He's basically just creating a universe where he gets to look at himself being amazing. And in a way, I feel like he can kind of earn it. I know that he said that he spent a lot of time kind of worshipping cinema. In this uh, interview that I read uh, from Influx magazine, he, this man loves movies. And you get such a sense of that through this uh, through this interview. Um, although one of my favourite quotes that I, that I have to say... Um, was when he was uh, talking about making movies and the the interviewer asks him like what like how did you come to this and he says prior to filmmaking i read every book on filmmaking but just never had any formal education but that's where the whole resourcefulness thing comes into play you know when you're out there on the set making films, you need to make your own answers. That's a part of being resourceful and professional and so on. And that's the other thing. There's been a couple of comments over the years that this is just a group of friends that got together and made a film. But all of my films have been turned totally professionally. Everyone, cast and crew on all of my films have been paid. There's no deferred payments. I'm not asking people to do things for free. I try to maintain all those very professional standards from a production point of view so that there's not just a group of friends working together in the backyard kind of thing everyone is being paid and that's very nice but that's just sort of like a little like whistle stop tour of neil breen and his new film k the tortured crossing is a um is a sequel to the other twin films uh, that came out this year and i also encourage you to check out the neil breen reddit because there are some crazy people are saying some crazy shit on there and also, he just did a November update where he basically just listed every single award that his new film had been nominated for, which is pretty special. But he just seems like a cool guy, and I think he is kind of a little bit, like, he's he's got an ego now, I think. But in the same way, he's worked very hard. And now he's sort of like, you know, he's he's entering the twilight of his life. And if this is what makes him happy, then I'm happy to see that. But maybe there will be something to check out. Dun, dun, dun. Uh, this Trash Film Festival. So keep your eyes peeled on the Trash Instagram, which is a Trash Film Festival uh, on Instagram. And yeah, I hope that you will come. I hope that this has been like a good little tease about that. And it'll, yeah, it's going to be good. Neil Breen, if you're listening, hey, I respect you, man. And, you know, you got to push the envelope. You have to be your own, you have to be your own advocate. And he advocates for himself hard. 
And he knows how to work the industry, I feel. And that's good. So stay real, Neil Breen. Stay real. This has been The Real Thing. I've been Joe Lawrence. See you on Monday for a regular screening episode. Thank you for listening. Goodbye.